All right, this morning I'm going to talk about the mark of the beast. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, maybe misconceptions about the mark of the beast and what it is out there. Um, so I will talk about this this morning. Um, now, Christians are taught that the book of Revelation um, is very difficult to understand. And they're taught the book of Revelation a bit like the Catholic Church teaches the Bible. Like, you can't just read it yourself and get a good idea of what it's saying and, and what it's talking about. And they sort of say that it's so complex that you just can't read it for yourself and just understand what is going on. Now, sure, you may not understand every single detail. You know, like even when we read through Revelation 13, do you know what everything represents? You know, do you know all the little details? You know, obviously that may take a bit of study, but you can at least read it and get familiar with what it actually says so you're not completely ignorant of the contents of it, right? So don't get this idea that you can't read Revelation for yourself, read it, know what it says, like, like we read through Revelation 13 this morning. You know that it's talking about a beast that comes out of the water, a beast that comes out of the earth, and they do these certain things. And then, at least when you know what the Bible says, then you can hear what people's opinions are of what they mean, and you knowing what the Bible says, you can then know, hey, is, are they stretching this further than what the Bible actually says? Or are they, where are they injecting their opinion versus things that the Bible actually says? Because a lot of far-fetched ideas are promoted on the internet under the guise of Bible prophecy. And some people, when they say they're really into Bible prophecy, what they're really into is all these theories about what's happening in the end times. But really, those theories can, can be vast and vary and can, differ, can sometimes differ from what the Bible actually says. Or they're using a verse in the Bible and they're saying, oh, well, that means this and that means this. And you watch that video, you listen to that theory and think, oh, this all makes sense. It's rational. It's reasonable. But you need to know the difference between somebody that's taking what the Bible says and then in applying what they think about world events to it and what does it actually say, right? Now, obviously this sermon will have some of my opinions as well, right? So when I explain to you today, hey, what I think Revelation 13 is saying here, that's going to have some of my opinions too. So this sermon really is meant to just serve as an appetizer, right? It's an appetizer, but you really need to get in the Bible. You need to read it yourself so that you're not so easily taken by and maybe, maybe something I say or something you hear on the internet. Because, you know, just because something sounds rational... That doesn't mean it's true, right? Because false doctrine sounds rational as well. I mean, you spend enough time with a Muslim, you spend enough time with a Jehovah's Witness, you spend enough time with a Mormon, they're going to have reasonable, reasonable and rational answers for what they believe. But then the question is, is it true? Does it line up with the Word of God? And that's what, why you need to know the Word of God, because it's, it's not like just other religions are teaching false things about the Bible. There's also people, supposedly freedom fighters out there, right? They're going to be teaching things about the Bible too because everyone's quoting the Bible these days and talking about end time, talking about the mark of the beast, talking about the one world government. But they're going to sound reasonable and rational too. So make sure, if you're into that sort of stuff, you read the Bible, right? You know what Revelation says. You know what Daniel says. So when you listen to these people, you can discern as a wise Christian, you know, is this actually what the Bible teaches? Is it actually what it says? If it is, then good. Good on them for spreading that word. If it's not, then you're not going to be easily taken by these rational-sounding theories, even though they may not be true themselves. Right? So we're talking about the mark of the beast this morning. First of all, before I get into the mark of the beast, I just want to go over Revelation 13, just verse by verse quickly, and explain what's happening in this passage. So you know, in Re if you're familiar with Revelation 13, obviously John is seeing these visions, right? And these visions represent things that are happening in the end times. And Revelation 13 is really talking about the rise of the Antichrist, right? The rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the false prophet, and the things that the false prophet is going to implement in these end times. So that's what these things represent. So he says here, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So, you know, this is where you can know what this verse says, right? But then 
when it comes to what do these different things mean, different people are going to have different understanding of what they mean. And we would pair scripture with scripture. So I'm not going to go too much into that today because I'm only talking about the mark of the beast. But you can see here, it's a beast. It's coming out of the sea. It's coming out of the water. It's got seven heads. You know, what are those heads representing? Maybe this beast is copying the seven spirits of God. And ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. So these represent... Um, in the Bible, the ten kingdoms, right? They give the power to the beast because there's going to be ten kingdoms. They give the power to one man and then he becomes basically the dictator of this global empire, right? And be like what we see in Star Wars, you know, he declares himself um, the, dic the, the emperor of the galaxy, right? It's like this guy. So he's going to be the dictator of the world. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So what do these different animals represent? I mean, when I think of the leopard, I think of that, that verse in the Bible. It says, can a leopard change his spots? You know, it's like this man is the man of sin, right? And his feet were as the feet of a bear and the mouth of a mouth of a lion. And the bear and the lion in the Bible are always described as these like very ferocious animals, right? The, you remember the kids that were you know, torn by, by a bear, right? And the, and, uh, and the lion is obviously seeking, uh, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. So you can see his feet are like a bear. His mouth is as the mouth of a lion. You know, you're thinking his mouth devours, seeking whom he may devour. And the dragon, who's the, what's the dragon representative of? The dragon is Satan, right? So he gets his power, his authority, and his seat, you know, his seat of authority, where he sits is always like a capital city of, of, of a nation, right? His seat and great authority, where does that come from? Ultimately, it comes from Satan. Right? And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So we see here that the Antichrist is coming, and he's going to be pretending to be Jesus Christ. And you can see here that he copies a lot of the things of Jesus Christ. He's claiming to be God in the flesh. And one of the things that he is copying is the resurrection. And this is why this is very interesting. He says, I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. So you can imagine that the Antichrist comes, and once he's revealed, right, he's going to pretend to be Jesus Christ, the second coming, and people are going to worship him. And one of the reasons why they're going to worship him is because they think he's going to get killed, but then he resurrects from the dead. Now, you know, like I said, these are, these are my opinions on what the passage says, right? We see here that he has this, you know, um, what was it? He has this head, one of the seven. The head is wounded to death, and his deadly wounds healed, and then people worship him. So then you say, well, why do people think these theories about the Antichrist? Well, you know, this is what the Bible says, and people think, hey, is this... How he's copying Jesus. Is he going to be assassinated, you know, as a world leader, but then he rises from the dead, he comes back to life, and people are thinking, it's a miracle. He must be of God. You know, he must be, you know, he must be, you know, God in the flesh. You know, this is how, this is how the world's going to be deceived. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So this first beast it would what be known as the Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming. He's a man who's ruling over. But who's giving him his power and his authority? It's Satan. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So you can see that the world, they're not just wor necessarily worshipping him, as in necessarily bowing down to him, but they're also just thinking, oh, it's like, they're praising him. They're infatuated with him. Just like people are infatuated with like the President of the United States. They're just like, you would go 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 all over them, right? And say like, oh, like, nobody else is like them. They come to do this. That's what people are saying about the Antichrist. Saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So he's obviously a very powerful figure as well with a lot of military might. Right? And he has the military of all the worlds backing him. This is how he's able to enforce this global kingdom. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So what's interesting about this passage is that it says here that it, uh, he's given unto him a mouth speaking great things. So who's giving him these words to say for which he's deceiving the whole nations? It's Satan. 
right? So he's not just speaking of his own accord. It's not just this, um, you know, very intellectual man that's come and taken the world by storm, right? In terms of his power and his charisma, Satan is actually behind the things that he's saying. And Satan, we know, is a very wise creature, right? He opened his mouth. Oh, sorry, in here. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. If you were to calculate that out into months, it's about three and a half years. And this is where people get the idea that the reign of the Antichrist is going to be three and a half years. Now, after this is when Jesus returns, right? Before the wrath. But we don't really know. It's, it's not as easy as, ah, the Antichrist is revealed. And then we just have to count 40 and two months. Because the Antichrist doesn't, isn't necessarily come on the scene when he's revealed you know so we don't know you when, when we hear about the antichrist when did he when did these 40 and two months actually start but we will know that jesus will come back prior to three and a half years after he is revealed right but we don't know when we don't know the day or the hour but we know roughly when these things are going to happen based on these timelines when this man man of sin is revealed and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against god to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. So one of the purposes of him coming, and one of the things he is going to do, is he is going to wage war on Christianity against Christians. Right? And to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this, is, uh, this idea of this one world government, this one world religion that is coming eventually. And the Antichrist is going to be given the power to rule over this one world government. And you can see how, how he's copying the Lord Jesus Christ. He's claiming to be God in the flesh, right? He's going to die, he's going to rise again. Jesus is going to rule with a rod of iron. Now he's ruling with a rod of iron. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So you see, it's not everyone's going to worship the Antichrist. This is not saying everyone who's not saved will worship the Antichrist, right? This is saying everyone whose name is not written in the Book of Life will worship the Antichrist. Because there's two ways to look at the Book of Life, right? Some people think when you get saved, that's when your name is added to the Book of Life. I don't believe that's how it works. I believe everyone's name is in the Book of Life, and then when you lose your chance to be saved, you are blotted out of the Book of Life, right? So if you die without Christ, you no longer have any chance to be saved, that's when your name is blotted out. But some people get their name blotted out even prior to death, right? There are ways to become reprobate even prior to that. And these are the people there, that they, they are reprobate. So all the reprobates that are in the world will worship Satan, but there will be people that aren't believers, that will also resist. I mean, even today, right, you see people resisting against tyranny, but they're not necessarily believers on Jesus Christ. They're not saved believers, but they still see the problem with what's going on, and they resist, and they will be caught up in that tyranny as well, and they will be killed like as we are um, in these end times. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Right? So this is the tribulation that we'll go through. And who's heading up this great tribulation, this tribulation that's happening in these end times? It's the Antichrist, right? He's the man on the white horse with a bow going forth to conquer. Verse 11, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So this is now another beast, right, in terms of the vision that he's seeing here. But this is not the Antichrist. This is the false prophet, right? If you remember the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 20? This is the other beast now that John is getting a vision on and describing, you know, in these visions, this other character that is coming up. And you'll notice, I thought it was interesting that the, the first beast comes out of the sea. I stood up on the sand and said, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And I know the water in Revelation sometimes represents people, and I always thought of this beast rising up out of the sea um, as like, you know, these dictators, they're always like democratically elected. Like they deceive the people and everyone's like, oh, he's like the beast. Who can make war with the beast? Everyone gets behind, they're always doing it for your own good, right? And they get behind these people and they vote them in and then they become a dictator, right? Kind of like what we see in, happening in Victoria. So is the beast going to be democratically accepted in before he starts really his, his reign of tyranny? But you see this second beast, 
Where does this second beast come from? Coming up out of the earth. I'm not 100% sure what that means, but you know, it just makes me think whether, you know, it's like, it's like today when we see um, you know, the press conferences with the premier and then you have like the, the, the government official, right? So you have like this, this idea of you have the person who's like democratically elected and then you have the bureaucrat, right? That then is also exercising power and things like that. And I wonder whether that's what these two may be, but the, the false prophet is obviously a religious figure, right? And pointing people to worship the Antichrist. Let's read a bit more about this second beast. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. I was saying this to my wife yesterday, because you know like in Matthew 7 how you have beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And this is where we get the idea of a sheep in wolf's clothing. I mean, look at this guy. This guy's like, he's a, he's like a, he's a dragon in lamb's clothing. Like even, even you know, his, his look is going to be even more gentle than a sheep, right? He's a lamb outwardly, but inwardly he's a dragon, right? Because he's saying the things that Satan is telling him to say, right? So even more deadly than a, a ravening wolf, even. So, you know, sometimes we think of the Antichrist, you know, maybe we watch too many movies to the Antichrist, we think of the false prophet, but we think they're just going to be obviously evil. You know, they're going to be dressed in black or ominous. You know, like in Star Wars, like the Antichrist is going to be like Darth Vader. He's going to be like all in black and all the Imperial soldiers, like in all of, the, of this New World Order, they're going to be all neatly dressed in all these German-looking outfits. But that's not going to be the case. This guy is going to look like a lamb. People are going to think, oh, and they're going to be saying like, man, this guy, it's like loving. It's like the, the way they talk about false prophets today. Oh, look how loving they are and how great they are, how kind they are. He's going to look like a lamb, but the things he says are coming from Satan, right? They're going to be deception, telling you to worship the beast. And for people that aren't saved and the people that get deceived, they will. Verse 12, and he exercises, exercises all the power of the first beast before, beast before him. So what does that mean, right? What that means is, remember the ten kingdoms give the power unto the beast, so he has great authority given to him by Satan and by the kingdoms of the world, and obviously the delegated power now to this false prophet, he also has the power to exercise this authority that is given unto this one world dictator, which is the Antichrist. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now what's interesting about the false prophet and the beast and this dynamic Remember we talked about how the Antichrist is going to copy Jesus Christ. This is also a way he's copying Jesus Christ because remember Jesus had a prophet come before him to prepare the way before him. John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's job was what? To point people to worship Jesus. So you can see how here the false prophet is a copy of John the Baptist pointing people to Jesus, right? But John the Baptist was only baptizing people with water. He performed no miracle. But this false prophet... He does perform miracles, right? He doeth great wonders, verse 13, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of all men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So notice that once the false prophet comes onto the scene, this is no longer some secret thing that's going on, right? The world is going to know by these miracles and he's going to be telling everyone to worship the beast. It's these open, these public miracles that he's doing is what is deceiving people into trusting and believing the Antichrist, worshipping Satan effectively. And this is why it's so important for people to understand that just because somebody does miracles... That doesn't mean that they're of God. You know, some people see like, uh, you know, supernatural things happen. Maybe even a miracle happens. Maybe a demon is exercised. All these sorts of things. Does that mean that they're of God? No. Right? So don't get carried away. Sometimes you'll, look, you'll be looking for things on the internet and then, oh, these people healed this and they're doing this. That's not what determines whether they are of God. Because the false prophet, the main false prophet, and there's many false prophets in the world. Deuteronomy 13 talks about false prophets. 
But the main false prophet at the end times, he's doing great wonders and miracles too. I mean, he's bringing fire down from heaven, you know, like Elijah did. But he's a false prophet, right? He's telling people to worship the wrong God and uh, leading people astray. And he had power. So he, he gets everyone. He builds an image. So these people, a lot of people think it's going to be a statue, the abomination of desolation that's set up in the temple, the rebuilt temple at the time. And he's going to be getting people to worship this image. And he's going to bring life to this image, that the image can speak. Now, is it going to be like a supernatural, you know, just a statue that supernaturally comes to life? Is it going to be some sort of robot? You know, is it going to be like an just a screen where it's just, you know, AI and the, you know, what do they call it? The, where they do the face thing with people and they, they, they make them do stuff. What do they call it? Like, no, it's like when, you know, they, 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 on YouTube now, they have all these, I'm trying to think of the word. Deep fakes, thank you. Deep fakes, where they can like make somebody's face, put their face on somebody else and make them say whatever they want. Is it going to be something like that? Who knows, right? But that's why we don't need to be dogmatic about how this image is going to speak and how, every, you know, can we come up with theories? But we don't need to be dogmatic about this is how it's going to happen and get upset when people say that's not it and all that sort of stuff. These are just theories about how this happened. We know, if you read Revelation 13, you know that this beast is going to give power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So notice that who is enforcing like this worship the beast, otherwise you're going to be killed. It's the false prophet, really, that is... Is like the bulldog of the Antichrist that's going out and enforcing this one world religion and tying it into the state and tying it into this mark. Verse 16, and he causeth all, and he causeth. Now I bet when you hear this passage in Revelation 13, 16, you probably thought that he was always referring to the Antichrist. But the Antichrist makes enforces this mark of the beast now it's the authority of the antichrist that the false prophet is operating on but who's the one that actually implements the mark of the beast the mark of the beast is implemented by the false prophet the false prophet is the one that actually goes and implements it and pushes it onto the population he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads this is why you have to understand, and we'll talk a bit about the mark of the beast later, that it's, it's going to be tied in to the one world religion. This is not just you going to service New South Wales and just like, you know, you know get, my, get my mark and nobody knows. This is tied into you worshipping the image of the beast. And when you worship the image of the beast, you are then allowed to participate in this global economy. Right? And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I don't think these are different options. I think that this is what this mark is going to look like. It's going to be identified with the beast, whatever his name is. It's going to have his number on it, which is told us it's 603 score and 6. So that's where you get the 666 being the number. People say it's the number of the devil. Well, it's not technically the number of the devil. It's the number of the Antichrist, right? Because he's a man. 6 is the number of a man. He's 666. So the Antichrist is a man, but people obviously relate it to Satan because that's who is ultimately ruling and reigning at this time through the Antichrist because that's who gave him his power. So I don't think these are different things. I think there will be a visible mark either in your hand, on your forehead, um, and it'll be identifiable that this is like there's this legitimate mark, right? Just like now that things have a seal of the government or... You know, you get your, your COVID tick and it's got the seal back there. Well, now it's not in the name of a government. Now it's not in the, it's the name of a man because a man is ruling around. That's why it's his number, it's his image, it's his name because that's where the authority from this one world government and this mark is coming from. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast for is the number of a man. His number is 603 score and six. So that's where we get that 666 from. All right, so let's now get into the mark of the beast just specifically for this sermon, right? So what do we know about the mark of the beast? So Revelation 13, 15, we'll go back there. He says, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. 
And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay, so first of all we see, like you said, you're not just going to be able to get this mark of the beast without worshipping the beast. Right? You worship, it's always tied in. You see in Revelation, getting the mark of the beast is always tied in with worshipping the beast. So it's not just this idea that Christians may be able to just you know, it's not just the Christians that want to take a public stand against this one world government. I'm not going to take the beast. But the people that don't, they can just get along with society and just keep going along and just get, the, get their, you know, thing anyway. No, that's, that's not going to be the case. Look at Revelation 16. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And they fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. You can see there that taking the mark of the beast is always tied in with worshipping his image. Revelation 19, the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So you see there again, which he which deceived them had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. And last one, Revelation 20. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. So this is how I think a lot of the people will be killed in the end times, is beheading. And you say, well, people say, well, why are people beheaded and not other ways? Um, because beheadings are cheap. You know, even killing millions of people, you know, if you give them the electric chair, it requires a lot of electricity, it requires the setup. You know, if you're going to inject them with something and kill them that way, I mean, now somebody's got to manufacture the, you know, the chemicals and administer the dose and blah, blah. Beheading, all you need is just a sharp, you know, guillotine. And you can just kill as many people as you want. And making a guillotine is very cheap, so it's very swift as well. So a lot of people think that's the reason why. Beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this is the opposite. These are people that didn't do this. What didn't they do? They had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads. So you can see there that it's always tied in with worshipping the beast. Right? Now, those who receive the mark of the beast can no longer be saved. Right? There will either be people that are already reprobate, or if they take the mark of the beast, they will lose their chance to ever be saved. Right? Why is that? Because in Revelation 14, 9, it tells us that everyone who receives the mark of the beast and worships the image, they will go to hell. That's what this the verse says in Revelation 19. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, so you see how these are always tied together, or in his hand, the same, so these same people shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. This is a very clear verse that hell is not separation from God. The reason why hell is so hot is when you are a sinner in the presence of God. That's what hell is, right? It's a place of punishment. But they're being tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. They have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and who whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So the name, why is the name his name? Because authority is synonymous with name. Usually when you do something by somebody's authority, you do it in their name. That's why we do things in the name of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It's because we're doing it by his authority. Right? By his authority is, is, is what that name brings. Now we looked at Revelation 13a. So remember how we talked about only reprobates will worship the Antichrist. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb 
slain from the foundation of the world. Now, I just want to stop at this verse for a bit because I think there's, there's different ways people understand this verse. And when you, you see it, you, you'll get what I mean. Now, what is from the foundation of the world? How most people understand this passage, they'll say, well, it's Jesus. He was slain from the foundation of the world. Because they'll say it's a book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But that doesn't make sense, that Jesus Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. Because it was 2,000 years ago that the Lamb was slain on Calvary, right? So this is not saying, I don't believe this is saying, that Jesus was slain prior from the foundation of the world, right? And then, then the question is, what happened 2,000 years ago? The way I think is this verse should rightly be understood is that the book of life has existed from the foundation of the world, right? Now, what is happening here? It's, saying, it's not saying that from the foundation of the world there are certain people whose names were blotted out. Because you say, what's from the foundation of the world? It's the fact that the names are not written in the book. So I don't think that would make sense either because you know, if their names were never in the book from the foundation of the world, that's a bit like Calvinism, right? That's like you, they didn't even get a chance to be saved because everyone's name is in the book and then they're blotted out when they lose their chance to be saved. And we don't believe in you know, losing your salvation, getting your salvation back. So it's not like your name's blotted out, it's written back in. Name's blotted out, it's written back in, you know, depending on how you live your life, right? So what is from the foundation of the world? What I believe is from the foundation of the world is the book of life itself, right? And what this verse is saying is the people that worship the beast, their name is not written in this book of life that's from the foundation of the world. And that's the book of life, which is who has life or not. And it's the book of life of the lamb slain, right? So if you read it, that's why right. it's interesting because there's no commas there, right? So the question is from the foundation of the world of what? And I believe it's talking about the book of life. So whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And I believe it's, the, it's referring to the book of life that's from the foundation of the world. Now, now we, can, now we know a bit about the mark of the beast that requires, requires worshipping the beast, worshipping the image. We know that everyone who takes the mark of the beast is reprobate. They can no longer be saved because Revelation 14 says these people who take the mark of the beast, they worship the image, worship the, the beast, they're going to go to hell. Right? It's, it's too late for them, unfortunately. They've, they've sinned that last sin, you know, in terms of uh, having a chance to ever be saved. So with that in mind, we know what the mark of the beast cannot be. Right? Now, we'll start first of all with the Seventh-day Adventist belief. What I understand from the Seventh-day Adventist belief is they think that going to church on a Sunday is the mark of the beast, right? So I guess the question is, they, they, they must believe that, you know, we're, we're worshipping the beast on Sunday. It's his system. I know there's a way that they, you know, uh, um, that, they, that they, ration, they rational it, they rationalise it. And I was just reading one of it last night where they think that, well, because the beast is referring to this sort of work salvation system and you know, they think that Saturday represents you know, going to church it's by grace, Sunday represents the works-based man system. So if you go to church on Sunday instead of Saturday, you're following this man system. That's what the beast represents. And that's one of the signs that you have this mark. You know? So there's, there's this really convoluted logic that they go through to sort of say the mark of the beast is going to church on Sunday. The question is, if the people that go to church on a Sunday have somehow taken the mark of the beast, does that mean they're worshipping the beast? Does that mean they, they can no longer be saved? Is, is that what that means? So obviously it can't be just going to church on a Sunday. But let's talk about like now the, the modern day freedom movement and what they are saying that the mark of the beast is. A lot of people ask the question, was well, the vaccine the mark of the beast? But now that we know a bit about the mark of the beast, the question is, did anyone need to worship any image of the beast or any antichrist in order to get the vaccine? No, so obviously the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. Right? What about what people say the, 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 the mark of the beast might be a, a digital ID? We see the digital ID coming in. Anyone who condones digital ID laws and all these things, that's going to be the mark of the beast. That is the mark of the beast. Or they'll say it's like a RFID chip, some, some tattoo. 
Now don't get me wrong, no doubt these technologies will play a part in the real implementation of the Mark of the Beast. And what my point is, don't get caught up that just these things that are happening now, that's the Mark of the Beast. That's the mark. If you get implanted, you've just taken the Mark of the Beast. If you get vaccinated, you've just taken the Mark of the Beast. Because that's not the Mark of the Beast. Right? Now will, in the end times, will it be tied into a vaccine? Who knows? Right? But these are, what I'm trying to get to you today is, you want to know what the Bible says, and you want to know what the theories are that people think uh, these things are talking about. Right? So no doubt, some of these things will be used to implement the system. But the system is not here yet. Because remember, it's going to be very obvious when the mark of the beast is here. Why? Because the Antichrist will come onto the scene and nobody might know who he is. And then when are we going to hear about him? Right? We'll hear about him when he dies and he comes back to life. Then the false prophet comes out. We've got to worship him. We've got to make an image to the beast. Right? And how do you know I'm legit? Because I'm bringing fire down from heaven. I'm doing all these miracles. You know, I've got two horns like a lamb. But he's speaking like a dragon. And then when the false prophet is implementing things, that's when he causeth all, both small and great, bond and free, to receive the mark. Right? So it's not going to be when the, when the real mark of the beast comes out. It's, we're not going to be wondering, is this the mark of the beast? Should I take this? Am I taking the mark of the beast? You're going to know it's the mark of the beast. Because unless you bow down and worship this image, you're not going to get it. Right? So, believers will not take the mark of the beast. Right? Why is that? Because everyone that takes the mark of the beast is going to go to hell. Right? But believers will not take this mark of the beast. Why? Because believers cannot have their name blotted out of the book of life. Look at Revelation 3 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So you can't lose your salvation. Right? That's why you can't, believers cannot do these things that will make them lose, make, make, you know, make somebody go to hell. Because you can't lose your salvation. So this is why the correct doctrinal understanding is believers will not do these things. They will, will not be deceived. Right? And we're told this in Matthew 24, that when this Antichrist comes, it says here in verse 23, then, then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. So it's not just going to be just the false prophets saying that Jesus Christ has returned. Right? It's going to be a bunch of different false prophets around the place. And he's saying, don't believe it. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. See, don't be deceived by miracle working. Because false prophets and false teachers do miracle working as well. In so much that, look at this, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So you see how like those that are saved, we won't be deceived. Right? But there's going to be a lot of church-going unbelievers. They will be deceived. And they're going to be the ones saying, like, Victor, you don't know what you're talking about. Look at this guy. He's Christian. He's bringing down fire. How can he not be from God? And you heard Christians say that. How can, how can he not be of God? He's like healing people. I mean, he's doing great works. How can the false prophet not be of God, guys? That's why you don't just go by some, the works that somebody does. You don't just go by the miracles that they do. It's, are they preaching the truth? Are they preaching the Bible? That's why your defense against false doctrine and deception is knowing the word of God, right? having the word of God in you so you know what it says, so you're not deceived. Right? But in the end times, we're talking about just this deception in general, but in this end times deception, no believer will be deceived into worshipping the image. And you say like, yeah, but Victor, you know, people have, like I was talking about before, you have this idea, but what if I just go and pretend? Can I go and pretend? Can I get, get the mark of the beast? And then I'll just, you know, fly under the radar and just go about my life. And I, I don't think that's going to be possible. And one theory that people talk about is, you know, they will have some sort of way to read your thoughts, do you know what I mean, in these end times. And Christians that think that they can just fly under the radar and get their mark of the beast and just try and continue to participate in society, they will be lambs lining up for the slaughter. Because you'll go to Service New South Wales and say, you know, come fill out my paperwork. And they're like, oh. Yeah, yeah, just come into this back room, you know, we'll get your mark, and then you just disappear. <laughs> so, I don't think it's going to be the case where people can just, you know, go in and get these things. And I think 
you know, just like today, when, you know, with the vaccine push and, you know, Christians as well are just like demonizing those that choose not to get the vaccine, you're experiencing a bit of what it's going to be like in those end times, right? Where people, they're going to believe they're doing the right thing and they're doing it for God and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, they're, they're going to be pushing an agenda. So let's go on. Revelation 13. What else do we know about this mark? Revelation 13. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we know that getting this mark of the beast enables you to participate in this global economy. And this is where we can really see, scarily, the COVID situation that is happening in our country as a precursor to how this will go down, right? Because we're already seeing that if you don't get the vaccine, you need the vaccine, you now need to prove that you're vaccinated, and then you have the vaccine passport. The vaccine passport is now going to enable you to go to restaurants and show this vaccine passport. So I can understand why people have this idea. Maybe the vaccine is the mark of the beast. But remember, it's not. But are, they going to, are these technologies that are being put in place, are they going to be utilised in order to carry out the mark of the beast? Probably. You know, the ID verification systems, you know, there's a further push for, you know, they say a cashless society. And what they mean by it, what we mean by a cashless society is that anonymous transactions are going to be outlawed, right? You're not going to be able to transact unless it's on, you know, the blockchain, right? On the crypto. We know that these blockchain technologies are coming out. They're likely going to be used to record all these transactions. Now, in the end times, will there be a black market? There probably will be. You know, amongst people that are on the run, you know, just trading and doing whatever they can to survive. But it's going to be against the law. That's the point. And it's going to be very difficult for anyone to start a legitimate business like today, what they're doing with COVID. It's like, you want to get away from COVID and you want to start a business, you got to do all the COVID stuff. So as much as they say it's voluntary, it's not voluntary because everyone has to comply with it and all the businesses have to comply with it. It's going to be the same with this mark of the beast. Right? So people say that, you know, cash is king. You just need to understand that when we talk about why, why cash is important, it's because about, it's about anonymous transactions that the government doesn't know about. Right? People should be able to transact with one another and have privacy there. Right? But it's not that cash is anything special. I mean, cash is just fiat pieces of plastic that the government just decrees has value. Right? It doesn't mean that cash is the same as gold and silver. Ideally, it would be money is greater than cash, right? So not a cashless society, but they're going towards a, a moneyless society, right? So people can't do anonymous transactions. So no doubt the technologies developed today will be used to enforce the mark of the beast in the end times. Now, I don't think for this reason alone that that means we should resist technological advancement, right? Because the mark of the beast is going to use computers. Does that mean we, sh we shouldn't have computers? Does that mean we should all be just still horse and buggy because in the end times they're going to have cars? And So don't get this idea that technology in and of itself is evil. The fight is not against technology. The fight is against how these technologies are utilised. That is what the fight is against. So, you know, don't think that crypto technology is evil. Don't think that, you know, smartphones are evil, you know. It's just technology can be used for good or evil. It's a, it's a tool, right? It's a neutral thing. So that doesn't, I don't think that means that necessarily the, stand, the right stance is just to resist all techno, technological advancement because technological advancement has benefits to society as well, right? This is why we live in a prosperous society. This is why we live in an efficient society. It's these technologies that allow us to live this way, right? But it does make us think that things that were not possible a few decades ago, you know, people hundreds of years ago may not have been able to picture how does this even happen? How does a one world government even happen when you have to travel for weeks and days just to take a ship to go to another country? How could you possibly enforce it in these rural towns? Well, the world is slowly coming together through technology, right? 
and with this flick of a button, they can unperson you, right? They can remove you off social media, just remove your presence completely. And if you require that presence to participate in society, you can see how much control they have now. I mean, they don't even do that today, and they can make people do things. You know, imagine what it's going to be like in the end times. It's going to be even worse, right? Way more authoritarianism there. And it's implemented by the false prophet, right? It's not the Antichrist. Obviously, it's the power of the Antichrist that is doing it, but, you know, it's, it's implemented by the false prophet. It's not done in secret. And it's in the right hand or forehead. Now, this is interesting. Let's talk about the mark of, the mark of God, right? Because the mark is in the right hand or in the forehead. And I know that in times past, people make a big deal between whether it's on the hand, on the forehead, versus in the hand, in the forehead. And they say that's why it has to be an implant. Because in. I, I don't think that that's really a distinction that needs to be made. I think it's just whether it's in the hand, in the forehead, on that. I do think it's going to be something visible. Now, whether there's going to be some underlying technology that's implanted somehow or underneath the skin that enables it to be scanned and doesn't rub off or whatever, um, you know, to me that's not so important, right? But I, I do think that this mark that we get will be visible, right? You'll be able to see it. Why do I think that? Because the Antichrist and the false prophet, they are copying what God does. And when we look at God's mark, God's mark is something visible. Right? So in Ezekiel 9, we see like sort of a prophetical situation in Ezekiel and the condemnation of a city about God's mark. So I don't know if you, know, if you knew that. It's not the only the Antichrist that has a mark. He's going to put it in the hand or in the forehead. Right? God's is only on the forehead. Right? But I, didn't know, I don't know if you knew this, right? that God has a mark, right? and it's on the forehead. And I'll, and I'll say why that's significant in a moment. Right? Well, it's, it, why, why, why is it significant? It's because the Antichrist is copying God. Right? And you can see how... Now you can get this idea of like, why are Christians going to be deceived? Because they're going to be able to use the Bible to, like, to, to, to say... You know, like Satan used in, in, in the, the temptation in the wilderness, he's using God's word. Satan knows God's word. And I have a feeling that in the end times, these verses that we're going to now, it talks about God's mark, those are going to be used to preach the mark of the beast. Right? And Christians are Christians that are not saved. Like people, I'd say churchgoers, I won't call them Christians, but you know, people with Christian upbringing, they believe they're Christians because they're trying to follow God, but they're not actually saved. They don't have their trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. The ones that get deceived will be deceived when it's taught incorrectly, right? And they don't know their Bibles. Look at Ezekiel 9. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, every, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. So the, the context of what's happening here in Ezekiel, you can read back in your own time. There's a lot of wickedness going on in the nation, right? Where people are like to the point where they are using God's temple to worship false idols. Like, you know, God's like showing Ezekiel inside the temple and here they are like, you know, worshipping the stars and burning incense to these false gods. And really that, what that is a picture of is the idolatry that we have in our heart. So when you think about all this idolatry in the Old Testament, you think like they're defiling God's temple. How dare they do these things? It's sacred. Hey, you know, when we're covetous, when we serve ourselves, when we have false idols, remember our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what's happening to God's temple. You know, so that's the picture that you should be thinking of when you say, yeah, we don't do that today. You know, we don't have a statue, you know, carry a statue around this hall, you know, and we're all worshipping and bowing down to it. You think that's, 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 you know, an abomination. That's abhorrent. But, you know, that's what happens in our heart. You know, this is what we've got to consider when we think about idolatry. And behold, six men came from the way of the high gate which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So God now is going to send judgment on this city, and there's six men, they all have a slaughter weapon, so they go out to go through the town. So you think about it, it's a bit like the angel of death coming into Egypt, right? How did they protect themselves? They put the mark on the doorpost, the blood. But here, this man clothed with linen is going to mark, and I think this, this man, I think, represents Jesus, but I could be wrong there. He mark, represents Jesus, and he's marking people, the mark of God. The glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub 
whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's ink on by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So the people that are crying out to God of all the abominations happening in their city, he says, Go and put a mark on their forehead. And so the others, he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him. So to the other five men, he says, Go ye after the man that's clothed in linen. Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. Come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. All right, so now they're going to go in. God's wrath is going to sweep through the city. Only those that have the mark will be spared. Then they began at the ancient men. And that's, you know, this is because you know how, like, this is how God works. You better get the mark. I think it's going to be wiped out. Now think about the Antichrist. Can you see how they're going to twist this into like they're doing for God and God's wrath is coming. They've got to get wiped out. That's, that's how they're going to justify killing everyone else that doesn't worship the beast in the image because this is what God does, right? In his holy wrath, but in the unholy wrath of the Antichrist, he's doing the, the, the opposite of God by killing the good and, and the mark is on the evil. Begin at my saying, Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, and he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. They went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face as Ezekiel, and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. As for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the ink corn by his side, reported the matter, and saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. So that is a prophetical of what God is going to do. Because in the end times, God will put his seal on our foreheads, right? So in Revelation 7, it talks about the 144,000 that get the seal on their head because they're the 144,000 that are still on the earth during the wrath of God, right? Whereas we go through the tribulation, we are taken out of the earth before God pours out his wrath on the earth. But 144,000 are sealed. So this is this picture of in Ezekiel, right, where those that have the mark of God in their forehead, they're not taken up with God's wrath in these end times. Revelation 7, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So you see here that God's wrath is about to be his weight. He would seal the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So this is referred to in our Revelation 9 as well. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the, the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth that have power. Have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Revelation 14, 1, And I looked, and, Lord, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So the name on our foreheads is the name of the father, right? And that name is on these 144,000, right, of those that stay there. And you can see that Ezekiel 9, that prophecy, this is when... This is the real event that happens that that, that that passage is about, where God's wrath comes in, but it's his seal, like the angel of death going into Egypt, it's his seal where God will pass over them and then they do not get hurt. So this is what, like I said, the mark of beast is imitating. 
right? So I what I'm assuming is that the mark of the beast is going to be similar in the sense that it's going to be a visible mark, like the blood on the doorpost, like the ink horn, right? The mark. I think it's going to be something visible. Now, like I said, does that mean that there isn't some technology underlying it that's implanted under the skin? Who knows, right? But it, it could just be on the surface as well. I don't think in and on, I mean, if you were to write something on your forehead, you could equally say it's in your forehead, right? Because if something's under the skin, you wouldn't say that's in your forehead because your forehead, I would say, is actually the outside of your head. If something's inside your head, you wouldn't say it's in your forehead, would you? So, you know, I, I think a potato, a potato with in and on, you know? But I do think it's gonna be something visible. Now, like I said, this means that Christians, churchgoers, people that have Christian backgrounds, say that they're Christians, who aren't saved, they will be deceived into receiving the mark of the beast using God's word. And I think that's going to be a very scary thing that plays out, that I think people like today, with what's going on in our country, they honestly believe that they're doing the right thing, locking everyone up, shutting everyone's businesses down, stopping people from working, forcing them to get vaccines. Like there are people out there, that's the scary thing, they honestly think that they are doing good. Like genuinely think they're doing good. Look at what Jesus says in John 16. He says, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. They're going to be thinking that they are serving God by killing all the people that don't take the mark of the beast, right? And that's who the Antichrist is claiming to be. All the blasphemy is claiming to be God. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them, and that these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. Oh, it's a chilling thought. But we can see, you know, even happening today, right? How people, you know, how even Christians that choose not to be vaccinated, they're being demonized by Christians that believe that they should be vaccinated and they believe it's God's will for them to be vaccinated. They don't realize vaccines are a choice, you know, you should be able to choose what you do. Revelation 22, this is the uh, second last passage I'm going to. Just want, thought this was interesting. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. So not only is the name of God going to be on the foreheads of the 144,000, the name of God is going to be on all of us, right? All of us who are you know, servants of God, we're going to have the name of God in our forehead as well. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Now here's an interesting question. We're going to have the name on our forehead, the name of God, like the Antichrist was trying to copy. He's got his number, his name. But the servants of God are going to have God's name on their forehead. And the question is, what name do you think that's going to be? Right? Well, he's saying here that the name of God is going to be on their forehead. Now, I don't think, I don't think there's, any, there's any question about what that name is. But if you're not familiar in the Christian circle, this, this is a contentious issue about what this name is on your forehead, right? Verse 6, And he said unto me, These things are true and faithful, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Right? So what do we know here? That it's going to be the name of God in their foreheads, Right? For the Lord God giveth them light. And it says here in verse 6, The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Now if you read further down in Revelation 22, we find out who this Lord God is that sent his angel. 
Verse 16, look at this. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, why is this a controversial issue? Because there are some people that, that for, for, you know, to, to, to no end want to disassociate the name Jesus to the other persons within the Trinity. Right? Now, we serve a God that is three in one which means the name of Jesus can be equally attributed to the other persons within the Trinity, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Because what did it say in Revelation? That, that they had the name of his Father in their forehead, right? But that name is going to be Jesus. But some people will make you believe that that name can't be Jesus because it's the name of his Father, right? And this is just a contention over questions about the Trinity, how the Trinity works. But let me ask you, if that name in our forehead is not Jesus, what name would it be? And some people believe that if you teach that that name will be the name of Jesus in your forehead, you're actually promoting the mark of the beast, right? Because the mark of the beast is going to be under another name because the real mark of God is not going to be the name Jesus because the name of Jesus' father is just, what name? But let me ask you, if the name sealed in our forehead is not the glorious name of Jesus Christ, are we going to have a lesser name on our forehead for all of eternity? Why do I say that? Look at what it says here in Ephesians 1. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And look at this. And every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So if the name on our forehead is not the name Jesus, are you telling me that the name we have for all eternity our point, is a lesser name because the name above all names is the name of Jesus. But what that means is as well, that means that the name of Jesus also applies to the other persons within the Trinity. Does that mean the Trinity doesn't exist? No, there are three persons in one spirit, right? And that spirit identifies as one person too. And this is why these, you know, these different links exist. So I think it's a great thing. I don't think there's any other name that is worthy <laughs> to be sealed on our foreheads for all of eternity. Um, and if it's another name, it's going to be a lesser name, right? Because like we read in Ephesians, he's above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So just in closing, just a few closing thoughts, just be careful about what you listen to on the internet, right? I'm not saying the internet isn't a source of good information, you know, my sermons are on the internet too, right? But what I'm trying to get you, you know, a bit of information about the Mark of the Beast, I hope it was interesting for you. But really what I want to drive home today is, you know, read your Bible. There isn't too much said about the Mark of the Beast. Like, you know, I've pretty much gone to, through all the verses that are relevant to the Mark of the Beast, and I went through it in one seven, right? Obviously, there's a lot more in the Bible. So it's not much of the Bible. So it's not much to go through. For you to have a, a good grasp at least of all the verses that talk about the mark of the beast. So that when you listen to things on the internet, you can now judge based on what you know from the word of God, what is lining up with the word of God or not. So when you do listen to some Bible prophecy video, you're a discerning Christian, right? You're not just blindly believing everything you hear just because it sounds reasonable. Because like I said in the beginning of this sermon, false doctrine can sound reasonable, right? but it doesn't mean it's true. Right? Our source of truth is the Word of God. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your Word. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you give us so much information about the world and so much information about, so we can know when we see what's happening in the world, we can discern from right and wrong what's true and false. Lord, help us to be Christians that know the Word, that know our Bibles. Help us not to be deceived by things. We thank you, Lord, that when the great deception comes, you will protect us from that. 
I pray, Lord, that you'll just give us the grace to take a bold stand now and even in those end times. Uh, help us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.